How did Martin Scorsese's cult classic After Hours end up entangled in litigation? We'll be looking at that today on The Charlie Kincaid Show. I'll probably get blamed for that. Let me introduce you to a man with two first names, Joe Frank, a radio artist that produced dramas for NPR Playhouse in the late 70s and 80s. Frank was famous for his surrealist deadpan humor, and in 1982 he released a monologue titled Lies, an 11-minute vignette about a man trying to make it with a woman whose roommate sold plaster of Paris bagels and cream cheese paperweights. The drama caught the attention of a screenwriting graduate student at Columbia University named Joseph Minion, and he adapted it into the first third of a script he completed for one of his classes, naming it after the radio broadcast. The script was later optioned by the Double Play Company, an independent production company co-run by actor Griffin Dunn. Meanwhile, Martin Scorsese was reeling after losing financing for The Last Temptation of Christ and was searching for a smaller project to recharge his energy. He was connected via his lawyer to Griffin Dunn and agreed to work on the project now titled One Night in Soho. In the film, Paul Hackett, played by Dunn, has a surreal encounter with a woman and after parting ways wanders throughout New York trying to get home. In the process, he gets blamed for a string of burglaries and gets chased by an angry mob. By the way, I thought this was interesting. Both Catherine O'Hara and John Hurd play prominently in the cast and even have an encounter at one point. They would reunite, obviously, in the first two Home Alone movies a few years later. Anyway. During production, Scorsese and company still had a lot of work to do to complete the script. Specifically, nobody seemed to know how to end it. The solution came from one of Scorsese's heroes, the British director Michael Powell, who directed with Emmerich Pressburger The Life and Death of Colonel Blimp, Black Narcissus, and The Red Shoes. Powell later married Scorsese's editor, Thelma Schoonmaker, but before that he suggested the only logical conclusion to the film was that Paul Hackett end his night by returning to his place of work seen at the beginning. The film premiered in September 1985. It was given positive reviews, but ultimately was somewhat forgotten in the Scorsese filmography. It's only more recently gained traction as a cult classic, and last year was added to the Criterion Collection. But I'm getting ahead of myself. There was a little problem, however. The screenwriter, Joseph Minion, had never received permission from Joe Frank to adapt lies from the NPR Playhouse. In fact, Frank had never even been approached. Like I said, the film premiered in September 1985, but it hadn't yet received a general release and was only showing in New York. A friend of Frank's phoned him up and asked him if he had seen Scorsese's After Hours yet. Frank was living in Washington, D.C. at the time and told his friend he had not. The friend told him to jump on a plane to New York as soon as possible to see it and would not elaborate any further than this. So that's what Frank did. And as soon as he saw the film, he immediately recognized it as an adaptation of his drama Lies. Quote, It was an astonishing experience because within the first few minutes I observed the identical story from my radio show unfolding on screen word for word. Let me add, however, that having used my story as the foundation for his screenplay, the remainder of the film was the work of the writer. It's an exaggeration to suggest the entire film was based on my radio show. What must the screenwriter have been thinking to place himself in such jeopardy? There's hardly been any information about the resolution to this dispute, but it's been alluded to that there was a lawsuit and Frank was paid handsomely for the plagiarism. Joseph Minion, the screenwriter, also has a very sparse filmography, so some have speculated that his career was likely derailed from the incident. Another interesting connection is that Larry Block, the actor that played the cabbie in the film, was also a friend of Joe Frank's and periodically worked with him on the radio. However, according to Frank, interesting though it may be, the two had not yet met in 1985. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please be so kind as to press the like button. And if you'd like to see more, please consider subscribing to the channel. I'll be revisiting After Hours in the near future for a look at how black comedy is constructed. See you then.